Welcome to Microsoft Office Outlook 2013 Part 2. My name is Sandra Batakis and I'm here to take you through a tour of some of the more advanced options within Outlook. Now, going way back, I remember using Microsoft Mail and actually building the post office server. And then we suddenly got this brand new program called Outlook. And I remember the day, I remember it very, very well, because someone had asked me to learn it inside out and backwards and to go ahead and teach it. And I remember that day thinking, I can't believe all of this is in one application. Everything from contacts to schedule to email, it was so nice to see everything in one spot. Well, I'm here to tell you that was certainly a long time time ago because that was the first version of Outlook that it had released. But I have had the pleasure of using Outlook every day just to organize my life, my email, and anything else it is that I do through this wonderful program. So throughout the years, I've had a chance to not only use it and teach it, but to see it grow into the great program that it is today. So let's go ahead and take a look. In this lesson, we're going to learn about some of the advanced message options. What this means is we'll learn where those advanced characters and objects are, how to find them, and how to insert them into a message. We'll modify some message settings. We'll learn about their properties and the different options available to us, as well as how to use automatic replies. Topic A, inserting advanced characters and objects. In this topic, we'll get a chance to learn how to insert a hyperlink, some word art, some interesting equations, a few symbols that aren't otherwise on the keyboard, some tables, some charts, look at some of the different chart types, and of course, we'll look at some quick parts. All in all together, how to dress up an email message and insert other elements other than just a basic message. In order to insert a hyperlink, we have within our insert menus and some of the options an ability to add it. Now, there's two different ways really to insert a hyperlink. One of them is to actually type in the hyperlink itself. And as soon as you hit the space bar, in most cases, you're going to see that it turns automatically into a hyperlink. Well, the big difference between that and a standard hyperlink is you're going to see here that I had to add the HTTP prefix in order to get there. And then the other part is to insert a hyperlink ensures that the click-through is going to be exactly where you need it to be. Also, there's a number of different options when you use the hyperlink option. Again, typing this whole thing out is one, but if you wanted a little tag to explain why you'd want to click there, if you want to add any amount of help text, etc., then if you use the hyperlinks option, you will have those other choices and options to add in. So, an example, if we just hover over the hyperlink, it tells us where it is that we're going. If you really want to get your point across and grab someone's attention, word art might be one of the ways that you do that. So, when you insert word art, you're going to see that it does give you this nice little graphical boundary. And I'm just going to point out and then erase it a little bit. You'll see that we have this icon right here. So, this kind of hovers around when the word art is selected. You'll see it's selected because I have these little notches available. So that tells me there's word art. I can go ahead and click on that and get some word art options. This tells me how it's anchored in a message, and to be anchored means if you add and remove text or anything to a message, how is this going to stay? Is it going to stay at the top left or the top right? Are you going to try to anchor it in the center of the screen? Also, we have our context sensitive menus. So, you'll see here, because our word art is selected, and when I say selected, I mean as an object, we've got these little handles, then you'll see that drawing tools immediately appears, and you'll see we have everything from quick styles to the ability of changing different elements about the text. Now here, we have a chance to add different options, and when I say different options, I really mean, geez, let's go ahead and surround it with an orange border, or a blue border, or a black border or to pull down this menu to get more options. Now, just to clear the screen so that I've got a nice, clear set of what we're looking at, if you want to change the word art option itself, that's going to be one of your magic ways in. Because there's two ways to edit what we've got selected. The first way is to edit it as what I call an object, and that's your drawing tools menu meaning I want to go ahead and put that orange border around it like I just talked about. That's treating it as an object. 
but what if in the word art you no longer wanted this type of word art, but you actually wanted the text that looks like it's in an arc, or maybe you wanted text to be in this shape. So we're kind of modifying the shape of the word art itself using the word art tools. That's the big difference between the drawing tools and really going back into the word art tools themselves to use that subset. We can also add equations. So not everyone uses equations on any regular basis, but there are certain areas, certain people, certain departments, certain job functions that really are basis for us to send equations on a regular basis. Now, if you were to think about some of the equations that you might write, you know, pi equals or E equals MC squared, you don't have those normal keys on the keyboard. So they become very, very difficult to type, again, because some of the more advanced equations realistically aren't standard keys. Now, we're not talking about 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's not really the equations because you have all of those keys on your keyboard. But here you can type in one of the um, more elaborate equations, and there are some that are in there predefined. Some of them you can type in, and as you're typing the equations, you will have equation tools with all the special characters. We also have a little menu that you can pull down that will give you some samples and stuff to start with. So equations may not be something that everyone types, but trust me, if you need to type an equation, you'll be very happy for it. However, symbols are much more common. Now, when you insert a symbol, again, you just go to insert, and you go over here to symbol, what you're going to find are all those unique symbols that aren't part of the US English 101, 102 keyboards, meaning, what about the euro sign? What about a copyright or a trademark sign? We might want to be looking at some of the mathematical symbols. And again, you'll see that they're all kind of listed here. What about today's temperature? You know, today's temperature is going to be 75. Geez, there is no degree on your keyboard, but we can use the degrees here from insert symbol. So there are all different ways to get things onto the screen. And you'll see that anything unusual, like a symbol, is going to be available to you. So typically, if I do 3 divided by 4, it is 3 fourths. But if you want to literally use the division key or the proper multiplication key, as opposed to using an X, notice we even have an affinity symbol, then this is where we're going. And notice, of course, if you don't see right here what you're looking for, it's only presenting the more common. We always have more symbols, and you can go through and browse and find what it is you're looking for. Tables are a very important tool. I use tables in virtually everything that I type. If I'm in Microsoft Word, I tend to use tables to really structure out a lot of the documents that I create, or even large portions of a document. And I do the same thing within an email message. Within an email message, we have an ability to create the same tables that we do in Word. So as you go to Insert and you choose Table, notice that we have Table Tools. It is context sensitive, so you'll see this symbol and that little notation, that handle, tell us that we've clicked within a table and Table Tools will light up. If by chance, under Table Tools, you don't see this menu, it means you've probably clicked down here somewhere and you're outside of the table. Click with your mouse inside of the table, you'll get your menu choice back, and you'll be able to do anything that you want to do. Now, with tables, one of the first things to notice is we do have table options. So, do we have a first column? Well, everyone has a first column, but what does that mean? It means that this column is going to be different. Maybe you want it to be shaded. Do we have a header row? Well, a header row is always this first row right here. Of course, everyone has that first row or first header row. But, do you want that shaded? So it's really just telling it what is spectacularly different about your table. Under Table Styles, we have a pull-down menu, and you'll see that you can quickly format this table to look fantastic in about one and a half to two clicks, depending on how much you hover over your different choices. We can do manual shading. We can design the borders. The borders, of course, are just these elements around each cell. We have the actual pen color and the pen thickness and the line style. We have a borders shortcut menu. 
And if you can't find what you want in the shortcut menu, if you pick the border painter, I actually love that tool because you click and drag over whatever borders it is that you want just like I just did, and it'll draw the lines only where you click. So here we're just on the Design tab. Keep in mind that Table Tools is Design and Layout, so if you go over to the Layout, you'll find all those other table options like merging and splitting apart cells and really affecting the structure of the table itself. We have an ability to insert charts. Now, when you insert a chart into an email message, understand that the data can come from one or two places. You can either type in the data right there because it might give you a data sheet where you decide to type in pizza, and the amount, soda, and the amount. And we can just go ahead and type in all the stuff that we want plotted and it will plot it. But if you have that information somewhere else in another table somewhere or in an Excel spreadsheet, we can also create a chart based on that data just by even doing a simple copy and paste from table to table. So what we have here under chart tools is we've gone to insert, we've chosen chart. Notice we can add a chart element. So let's say I want a chart title, that would be an element. Do we want a legend? Do we want to take these pieces off? We have quick layouts, which is really a little of this and a little of that, kind of the more common options. Now, by default, we're going to use the basic chart colors that have to do with the color palette, but we can change all of the colors, which means maybe these aren't our favorite colors and there's entire color palettes to choose from. We have chart styles. So here we've got our starting point. I can tell because it's got the blue lining around the border, but maybe we like something that looks more like this. So in one click, we can have that. And do notice right here, we can pull down the menu. There's all sorts of other choices in there. We can select data in order to modify it, to change it, to add some more. We can edit our existing data, and that'll open up those data sheets, and that's what we call it when we have kind of a table of information and numbers that we're plotting. And we can also change our chart type. So changing our chart type might be from um, our column chart, which is what we're looking at, to maybe we want a bar chart, which is more horizontal in basis. We can do pie charts, but do keep in mind that different charts do have different reasons. So, in example, if I wanted to change what we're looking at to a pie chart, I can't do more than one series. So, if we were to pick series one, then it's only going to map those four segments on a pie chart. So I can't do series one, series two, and series three, and then have each series subdivided, or even by category. So if this was to be category one, then you will see that, you know, I would have series one, series two, and series three, but only for category one. So a pie chart can only kind of take one subject and divide it down. If I wanted pie charts for this, I would have to build a separate pie chart for each one. So just understand that different charts have different reasons. I, over the weekend, was doing a plotter chart where I was looking for trends, where we just mapped a whole lot of numbers that seemed to be unrelated, but I was able to put all of that information in for a customer and then follow a trend to see how things actually related to each other. So again, just some ideas. Simple charts, super simple. There's a lot of choices. You just got to know what it is you're trying to do. So here's just some of the examples of our chart types, the different designs. So here, you know, we've got our basic column chart, but notice in one click we can change it to virtually any one of the ones that we see in the list. I remember the old days where Yes, I taught charting for probably eight hours. We could do a full day of charting because I had to show them how to do the background, how to change the bars, how to add a title. There were so many elements to changing the look and feel of the chart. And now what we have is we have a menu and we click on the one we want. And if there's anything we want to change from there, we can fine tune it.
Quick parts are fantastic. So if you find that you're doing a lot of things repetitively, and when I say repetitively, it literally is either a signature line, a disclaimer, or maybe it's the same typo ever. Now what I like is I happen to do a lot of work with SharePoint. And what happens with SharePoint is I just type it so fast that it's always typed out like that. Well, the correct way to type in SharePoint is to capitalize P and point, but it's still considered one word. So that's the proper way to denote it. So instead of me correcting myself every time, typing it out, backspacing over, or having it find misspelled. That was actually the other one. It was always marked as misspelled. I put in an auto text and an auto correct that said, if I type this, automatically type it into that. And I could shortcut that. Um, now, when we go into auto text, it is a little different than auto correct. Auto correct says, if I type it and when I hit the space bar, automatically change it to this. Well, now what I did is I created, because I type it so often, I created an auto text that says if I do a capital SP, as soon as I hit the space bar, it automatically turns into SharePoint Server fully spelled out. So again, you're really just building in your own little shortcuts. If it happens to be full paragraphs of text, a lot of different things that you're typing, we use this a lot in um, law firms so that we don't have to worry about typos and a mistake in, in legal terminology. I put all that in auto text. So we just ask for it and it's the same thing over and over.